to all the stuff associated with academic affairs and instruction. And, and that, that's really true. Uh, so my division does all the program approval from certificates through doctoral programs. We do program review, uh, particularly at the graduate level. There's a rather extensive graduate program review process, uh, much less so for bachelor's degrees and other degrees. Uh, and, but we also handle uh, oversight of private and proprietary schools that operate in Texas. So that also falls under uh, my division. And then we handle about close to $100 million a year now in grants. Uh, so most of you are probably familiar, or at least some of you are familiar with Perkins. And so my division uh, runs the Perkins grant. And for those of you who haven't attended one, then there will be all these interesting things that we're doing uh, to get some feedback from folks. And I think the next one will be in uh, Tarrant uh, County next week, if I remember correctly. Next Thursday morning, I think. Uh, right, so. Uh, so we, we do, those are the three major functions that, that we carry out. Is in, in, included in that uh, other uh, sort of academic affairs stuff is we're also responsible for transfer policy, dual credit policy, and core curriculum. So, what I, but what I'm going to focus on today is to talk about some legislation that's passed uh, and, and bills that came up. Uh, and I will end with Senate Bill 25, which was a big transfer bill, and, and also the piece about it that deals with uh, core curriculum. And that's where I'll also talk a little bit about the negotiated rulemaking process for those of you who are not familiar with it. Okay, so first thing I want to talk about is actually not a, a well, actually it would be legislation HB1, which is the appropriations bill. And so, uh, generally speaking, higher education in Texas came out with more money. Okay? Now this is not true of every college, by the way. Uh, this is particularly true of community colleges where some of the smaller uh, rural colleges, uh, due to a decrease in contact hours, uh, also lost some funding, uh, but overall, Funding was up about 7%. The big change for community colleges is that uh, performance funding points went from, what, 187 to 205 or something like that. And so that's about 12% of your total funding now is through performance funding. Uh, it started out at 10, it's now grown to uh, 12%, roughly speaking. So in some respects, the, the legislature was uh, good to higher education some ways, at least in terms of money. Now, I, I will you know, caveat that by pointing out that the increases still don't put you in a position where you're fully recovered from the losses from the recession and the budget cuts before, by the way. And, it, and those increases have not kept pace with the enrollment that's occurred at both uh, two and four year institutions. When actually, four year institutions enrollment has grown a little bit faster than two year institutions. And actually, at two-year institutions, the only reason enrollment has grown at all in the past few years is because dual credit has grown. Uh, uh, if without that, uh, enrollment would actually be flat or down. So and dual credit has grown by leaps and bounds from fall 17 to fall 18. It's a 30,000 increase in number of students taking dual credit. Uh, so and the, the legislature did not do anything of any imported all the dual credit this time around. Last legislative session, they, they passed some statute. Then you would get that this time around, they decided to just sort of let it stay and see what happens and check back in a couple of years. Uh, and so, so that part of it was left alone. I will talk a little bit about HB3, which was the, the huge school uh, K through 12 finance bill. And uh, so it put billions of more dollars into public education, which I don't think anybody would argue was not sorely needed uh, in many, many ways. And so uh, I think I, overall, I think that was a good thing. There are a couple of things that will impact higher education out of that HB3. And one is that before HB3, college readiness and career readiness were find in the same way. And, and the interesting thing about this is the, the sort of evolution of this over time, where a few years ago, how many of you remember the 4x4? Four four? 
Okay, so remember the four by four was the default curriculum for high school students, and it said they had, you had to have four years in English and four years in math and four years of other stuff. Um, but you know, it was not forget exactly what it was, but it was primarily English and math was the deal. Uh, and so that was the default curriculum, and a student had to opt out of that if they wanted to. And then uh, the, the criticism of higher education reached a, a high level a few years ago, uh, especially in, in Texas, where a lot of people argued about whether we were producing enough workers or not. And uh, I, many of you have heard me talk about this before, but I attended a meeting at the Railroad Commission. This is, goes back a couple of years, actually, now, before this last legislative session, anyway. And, uh, the, the topic was, there, well, there was a lot of different agencies represented, but there was also a lot of business and industry there. And the, the whole thing about it was how do you uh, prepare folks for work in the oil fields and industry related to that, you know, like chemical processing and so on. Right. And there was uh, one particular industry representative there who kept saying, I don't need people to go to college, I just need them to go to work. And I need people to watch them holes. Now, I was fascinated by this whole thing about watching them holes. And so I sort of probed that one a little bit, and what I found out was that they, there was actually people hired to watch holes. And so, I mean, once you sort of learn about this, and you think, well, okay, that actually makes some sense after all. But they watch the hole, and if something different happens in the hole, then they go tell somebody there's something different happened, you know, in hole number four, or, or, or how they identify these things. Uh, and so, but but the constant refrain was, I don't need people to go to college, I need people to go to work. And I, 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 I don't know why I decided to be diplomatic that day, but I, I guess I decided to be. And so I decided not to say anything, but going through my head was, well, you know, and, and let me back up and preface this. Myself and one of my fellow assistant commissioners was at this meeting to present the 60 by 30 plan. I mean, that's why we were there in the first place, really, was to present that and talk about it. And I kept wanting to say, well, wait a minute, our 60 by 30 plan only calls for 60% to have a degree. That leaves 40% without one. How many do you need? <laughs> Do you, I mean, so do you need 45% without a degree to satisfy? And so there's often this sort of disconnect a lot of times there. But it really got me to thinking about, you know, this whole connection between work and college and so forth. And so part of the evolution of this is then that HB5 comes along and it removes the 4 by 4 as a default curriculum for high school students and goes back to uh, what well, sort of what would have been formerly called the foundation school plan or the foundation plan, uh, but it removed those requirements for uh, courses that were really aimed at college readiness, and they began to focus on career readiness, and then they decided to define college and career readiness as exactly the same thing. The, the problem with that has been that under the four by four, the number of students needing developmental education started declining, and after HB5 went into effect, the number of students seeing developmental education started going back up again. And so HB3 makes some attempt to try to correct some of this or, or try to find a balance between the two competing forces of getting college, uh, getting kids ready to go to college and getting kids ready to go into the workplace immediately after high school. And what it does is it still, it still sets up the same curriculum that in many ways the default curriculum is still more uh, employment oriented at the end of high school, but it provides incentives of $3,000 and $5,000 per student for those who are deemed college ready at the end of high school and then enroll in college. And, uh, I, I'm sorry, it's $5,000 and $7,000 bonuses for this. And college readiness is defined as uh, meeting the coordinating board's exempt scores for SAT, ACT, TSI. That's all. Now, before that, college readiness was also defined as going into the military and achieving an industry place uh, certification in high school. And so, 
Now, 5,000 and 7,000, and the 7,000 is for students who are considered to be uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged. And the, the bill actually says educationally disadvantaged. That has a very wide definition. Uh, but TEA seems to have sort of gravitated toward defining educationally disadvantaged as being uh, economically disadvantaged. There's a lot of overlap between the two, but they're not necessarily the same thing. So that, I think that's a little fuzzy still and kind of remains to be seen exactly how the terms will be defined. But nevertheless, you know, one of the rules in, in life, right, is to follow the money. And so if all of a sudden high schools are going to get, and ISDs are going to start getting $5,000 and $7,000 bonuses per student to make them college ready, what are they going to start focusing on? College ready. Uh, only the stupid ones won't. <laughs> there's a handful of them out there. Uh, and, and there's at least one person on that board that will figure this out and fix that situation. But, you know, so I, I find it sort of interesting that they have really focused on this idea of college readiness. And they put their money where their mouth is, if you will, in that sense, because they've decided to incentivize that uh, for institutions to get there. So I, th I think that's a... That that's the piece of HB3 that will really affect colleges. And of course, for colleges, what that means is, over the long run, what this should mean, uh, or hopefully will mean, or depending on where you're at, not so hopefully perhaps, is that the number of students coming to our institutions that need developmental education will decline. Now, it'll never go away. But it, but it will decline so uh, and, and in the large scale that's not a bad thing now if you're a faculty member in the developmental education department you may have a different view on that but, but trust me they'll be this is going to take a while to see the effects and so this is not going to show up next year you know, it'll take a while to, for the effects to really work their way through the high school curriculum and sort of out the other end, if you will, to see that. So, uh, so I think that's the most important piece of HB3. So I'll talk about a couple of other things. Uh, House Bill 449. So how many of you are familiar with it? If you're not, you need to get familiar with it because every one of your institutions is going to be required to put a notation on the transcript for any student that is not eligible for re-enrollment for non-financial or non-academic reasons. Okay. So we make students not eligible for re-enrollment because they just managed to somehow academically blow. I had a nephew once, uh, some, some of you may have heard me talk about my nephew. I only have one, and so it's the only one I can talk about. Uh, <laughs> and, and he provides plenty of fodder for discussion. By the way. Uh, but you know, one, one of his claims to fame is a, a full scholarship debater. And by his second semester, I, I actually believe his grade point average was below 1.0. Uh, and so he so he lost his full scholarship debater, needless to say. You know, part of it was actually based on some academic performance. And since he had virtually no academic performance, then he lost his scholarship to Baylor. Uh, but I, I will say that he, his mother, my sister sent him off to the Army. He got out of the Army and went back to Sam Houston State and uh, graduated. And, and, you know, uh, and, well, I won't tell you the rest of the story because it kind of goes like that. <laughs> uh, so students do or find themselves ineligible for enrollment for academic reasons, these one of them, or sometimes they just don't pay their bills and that will get you faster than anything else will. You know, I discovered a long, long time ago that if you want to get out of something, just don't pay your dues. And they will take care of it for you. Uh, and so those two things are very common. What this is aimed at getting at, by the way, is there was an instance in Texas, and I will not name the institutions involved, for a student that was uh, charged with sexual assault at one institution and later found guilty of it by court of law, transferred to another institution, committed the same crime there. And that prompted, that prompted this idea of let's put it on the transcript so the receiving institution can see. 
Now this is for non-academic or non-financial, so it may not be sexual assault, it may just be that you tried to burn your dorm room down or something. So, but it would be any of those other reasons. There are uh, built into the provisions of that law, there are provisions for students to be able to appeal this, but the notation goes on there, it stays on there unless it's removed for cause. Uh, this is one of the things that will be the subject of negotiated rulemaking. Uh, we have three of these next week, no, week after next, 23rd, 24th, and 25th of September. I'll have three negotiated rulemaking uh, committees in a row, and one of them will deal with, with this issue, this issue of how to note these things on transcripts uh, and how they'll be sent forward, and I think even more importantly, how they might be removed. Uh, but that's, that's there, uh, and it's coming, so make sure you're aware of that. Uh, another one is uh, House Bill 1735 and Senate Bill 212. Now, these are, if you've not seen these, you should take a look at them. Uh, look at 212 because everything that's in 1735 is also in Senate Bill 212, but there's more stuff in Senate Bill 212. But this deals with the reporting of sexual assault, sexual harassment on the part of institutions. And it is a very detailed bill. Now, some statute is sometimes vague, and this is where rulemaking comes into the picture. So the statute is vague, it doesn't necessarily, nobody really knows what it means, and then agencies like the coordinating board get to do rules on it to try to tell everybody what it really does mean, assuming we can figure this out. Uh, and one way to do that is by negotiating rulemaking. Uh, so normal rulemaking staff comes up with a rule, uh, it goes through the board, it goes out for public comment, then we may need to make adjustments to it, and often do as a result. Actually, it goes out for public comment before it goes to the board. Ultimately, the board approves. Negotiated rulemaking is a little more formal process, uh, barred from the feds, that uh, says that you create straw men, uh, to something for the committee to start with, and then you bring a committee together, uh, using those committees range anywhere up to 24. By statute, we cannot have an advisory committee or really a committee of any kind that has more than 24 members on it. And so uh, if we get enough nominations, then we'll go to 24. Believe it or not, we don't always get enough nominations for a committee to go to 24. Almost all of them stipulate that they have two year, half four year. Uh, so that sometimes we get, we don't get enough nominations for one sector or the other. Uh, but this one will have 24 people on it and two-year and four-year representatives, and they'll come together to talk about the rules that surround this bill. Uh, and it does, it has very extensive reporting requirements for every institution in Texas. There are two things that really distinguish it from sort of normal legislation regarding higher education. One is that this also applies to private institutions. And you don't see that very often. Now, there is legislation that applies to private institutions, but most of it applies to public institutions, not because the theory is they're getting dollars from the state coffers, and so you can regulate them. Uh, you can't always regulate private institutions that don't get dollars from the state coffers, but that's allowed for certain purposes, and so they decided that the reporting of sexual assault and sexual harassment is important enough and severe enough in a lot of ways that everybody has to report this stuff. So two-year, four-year public and private institutions are all subject to this bill. The other thing that distinguishes this legislation from any other legislation, there is no other place in statute that you will find a coordinating board given the ability to levy a fine. So most of this bill is about how do you report this stuff. It also contains a lot of language, by the way, about uh, protection for both uh, victims and for alleged perpetrators. <coughs> One of the criticisms from the previous legislative, legislative session was that the legislation passed around sexual assault, sexual harassment, did not protect uh, those accused well enough. And this one actually has some uh, protections built into it, uh, both for the victim uh, and for the accused. Uh, before, uh, one of the major changes is that before an institution was required to investigate allegations, but only if the 
victim actually filed a formal complaint or you know, that is no longer the case. Right? This is this child protection took this up a long, long time ago, and that is, uh, you know, even if the kid never says I've been beat, if you think they have, you know, I mean, supplies to teachers, for example. If a teacher in the public school system thinks a kid has been abused, then they have to, they're required by law to report it. But not that the kid has said, I was beat to a pulp this morning, okay? But if they think he was, and in this case, even though the victim may say, I do not want to, you know, the, the sort of classic, I don't want to get anybody in trouble kind of thing, but I want to tell you what happened anyway. <coughs> and, uh, and, and we could, and when I say we, I mean the academic community could then say, okay, then unless you're willing to file a formal complaint, I really can't do anything about this. But now, if you're told, you're going to be required to do something about it anyway. So that's a major change. But the other is that if you are found in non-compliance with the reporting uh, component of this, then the coordinating board can levy a fine of up to $2 million. Which, which is kind of stunning in a way. There's no other piece of law that allows the coordinating board to levy a fine, much less of one up to $2 million. Bucks. And so and $2 million is enough. And, and I can tell you that legislators have taken this, in the last two sessions have taken the whole climate that revolves around sexual assault, sexual harassment, and so forth, very, very seriously. And, and they have really gone out of their way. Uh, that doesn't sound quite right. But, but they've really put a lot of emphasis on this. And I think that bill is a clear signal to institutions that this is something that we take very seriously, and you better take it very seriously too. And if you don't, then we can, we have, you know, we have authorized the court anymore to find you up to two million bucks. Now, I personally, now, that's not in my department, that's in compliance monitoring. Thank goodness, but I personally hope that the coordinating board never has to get in a position where we have to make a decision about whether to find somebody or not. Um, that, that doesn't bode well for the institution uh, or for us or anybody else for that matter. But, it, but it's a very serious issue, and I think that, again, that it really demonstrates uh, the seriousness with which the legislature views this uh, and, and how they have come to accept what a, what we have sort of known for a long time but has not been necessarily publicized, that there is a serious problem here. Um, and that somehow we have to figure out how we're gonna address it and we need to address it up front. And so that's, uh, so familiarize yourself with that, especially people who work in uh, student affairs, that kind of thing in particular, because uh, in your Title IX coordinators, Okay, we'll uh, want to be aware of this. There's also provisions in there for training. Uh, there's a, an advisory committee that will be established as a result of this that will look at training and professional development for people that will be required to do the reporting and that kind of thing. So they also thought about, let's just not tell them to do a bunch of reports. Let's also try to help them do the reports and help them figure out what it is we're looking for and, and what we need to know. Okay. So, uh, as I said, I, I think it's a very serious issue. Uh, one thing I'll mention a little bit in passing is uh, HB, whatever that is, uh, 3652. I, I'm one of those that I sometimes find it difficult to read on handwriting. And I printed this to try to make it easier. Because it's even worse, right? Okay. But, uh, most of, now, nowadays, though, I, so I've only been wearing glasses for like three months. And so now I just tell people, well, I am going blind. So there's my excuse. Uh, so what did I say? 3652. <laughs> so this is open educational resources. Um, and, and I mention this because it's one of those things that can have a tremendous impact for students in, in two particular ways. So the previous legislative session passed a law, uh, and, and this is kind of interesting because, I thought it was kind of interesting because uh, of, of all the, the, in the last legislative session in 2017, the agency got no new money except for OER and, uh, and a state repository for transcripts for colleges that closed. 
So, so I always, you know, so I could then sometimes, you know, strut around and claim that my division was the only one in the agency that actually got more money out of legislation, and that I should be rewarded for that with ten percent of it or something. That didn't happen, but anyway. Uh, so, but I think it also is one of those things about even in a tough budgetary period, the legislature sort of recognized that, okay, here's a way to save some money for students and so forth. So the last legislative session, they said, okay, coordinating board, you have to study uh, the feasibility of establishing an open education resource repository, enter some grant money for faculty to create these things. And in this last time around, they, so we did the feasibility study and we said, yes, this is feasible. It's actually not that hard, so it's more than feasible. And we gave out 13 grants to develop OER. And then this time around, they actually increased the amount of money we got and said, so you're now being directed to create the repository for open education resources, and then you got this other money for grants. And we had the writer written in such a way that any money that's not spent for the repository, then can be spent on grants. And it's really important once you get past year one, because it's going to cost $100,000, $120,000 to establish the repository in the first year, about 20000 20 to 30000 a year to maintain the repository after that. So the first year, I don't have a lot of grant money, but then in second and subsequent years, there's a lot more grant money for this. And we've increased the amount of money available for the development of these things from five dollars to $10,000, $5,000 for a single course, $10,000 for two or more courses to 8,000 for a single course, 16,000 for two or more courses. The RFA for the grants will go out right after the October board meeting. Uh, they're on the agenda to be approved there and the request for offers, which is where we'll also solicit people to tell, you know, to give us their bids for creating the repository that will also go out right after October. Uh, and I think this is important for two reasons. One is that we all know that textbooks cost a lot of money. I used to be sometimes stunned at how much they cost. When I was at Midland as a VP of construction, I went to the bookstore one day to buy junk food. And I'm standing behind this student who just bought a college algebra textbook. And that, that damn thing was like $125 or something. And I thought, this is absurd. And, and uh, and I co-authored a textbook at one point on Texas state and local government. And one of the reasons that we got out of it was the fact that they wanted to create a new edition uh, every time we turned around, uh, like every three years, which in government circles makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, none, they always wanted to have a, every two years they wanted to have the, the elections edition, which also makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, but be that as it may. So we eventually, after I think about four editions, this thing we got out of it. But uh, the cost has become <coughs> extraordinary. And for a lot of kids, they can actually spend more money for textbooks than they can for tuition fees at the community college level. And of course, they're no cheaper at the four year level. Right? Tuition fees are going to be more, but the textbooks are not cheaper. OER provides a way to provide free textbooks for folks or, or much reduced costs for students. And I think anything we can do to reduce the cost of education is going to be a good thing. If Texas is going to reach 60 by 30, we have to go after socioeconomically disadvantaged students because we already got everybody else. And our high schools are dominated by socioeconomically disadvantaged students. And so if we're going to lift them up, and we're going to maintain the prosperity that we have all enjoyed in Texas for quite some time. We're going to have to go after that population and make sure they get into college and through college. In, in whatever form that is, whether that's a, a certificate, an associate of applied science degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's, or a doctoral program, in whatever form that comes to the student, we need to make sure they get there and reducing the cost of textbooks is one way to do it. I also think that there's a tremendous opportunity here to improve teaching and learning because one of the things about getting your textbooks canned from a publisher is it makes it real easy for you not to pay a whole lot of attention to it. I was a faculty member. I understand. I, you know, I've been through this. 
And when we did a textbook, you know, we did the textbook and we did a test bank and an instructor's manual, you know, and that kind of stuff. OER actually requires you as a faculty member to be a little bit more involved in it. Because you can actually create your own materials this way. You can take what's already there, you can modify it, reuse it, revise it, and so on. And as a result, if we get, if faculty are more involved in the material that they're teaching, then students will also be more involved uh, in the material that they're supposed to be learning. And at the end of the day, none of this stuff matters if nobody's learning anything. That is, that is the ultimate goal of all of this, is to make sure that somebody, the people out there are learning something. Because if they don't, the whole enterprise fails. And, I, and again, I just think this has a tremendous opportunity to be impactful both in terms of cost, but also in terms of the teaching and learning process itself. So let's talk about Senate Bill 25. This is probably the most far-reaching piece of legislation dealing with higher education that came out of this session. Senate Bill 25 has been portrayed as the uh, panacea for all of our transfer problems. I have no doubt that it will help. I don't think we've reached the panacea part yet. Uh, I think this might help us get there to some extent. If you haven't seen this bill, it's a long bill. There's several pieces to it. One of them is the reporting function. So this says that institutions have to report courses that don't apply to a degree. Right? And there's two pieces to it. One is for four-year institutions. And what they have to do is report on um, transfer students who come in and then report on the courses that they transferred in but were not applied to a degree and tell why they were not applied to that degree. Okay. Now, my contention all along has been that all the institutions have this information. It's just not readily available. Some of this stuff is on a post-it note in somebody's file somewhere. Okay, Because that, that's how degree stuff works. Let's face it. And now it's gotten much better. I mean, this stuff has become, over the years, has become much more automated. And so a lot of institutions are ahead of other institutions in terms of being able to do that. Most degree audit functions are now automated. But a degree audit function, like everything else, is only as good as the information that was put into it in the first place. Uh, and so there's some work to be done here. But the hope of this is, is that at the end of the day, we can, we can have a better understanding of why it is that students who started a four-year institution and graduate from that same four-year institution, their level of excess hours is less than zero. It's actually a negative number because they get to bring in AP and whatever. Okay. Uh, two year to four year, that number goes up. Depending on who you want to talk to, it goes up anywhere from 16 to 25 hours on average. Uh, what we don't talk about much is four year or four years actually higher than that. In two year to two year, what little uh, study we've done of that is even higher than that. That transferring from a two year institution to a two year institution is actually the worst case scenario for a student. Uh, that's programs of study are designed to try to address that issue. But Senate Bill 25 says that the four-year institutions have to report on the ACGM courses that have been transferred and not applied to a major. <coughs> Two-year institutions have to report on any courses at that institution that are ACGM or WECA, which of course is all your courses, but they have to report on those courses that were not applied to a degree there. Because, you know, in the past, what we, you know, when all this got started a few years ago and people really began to look at it, the average time to a degree for a four-year was like 145 hours for a 120-hour degree. But the average time, or the average semester credit hours, rather, to a degree for a two-year degree, said at 60, was 96 hours. So, you know, so, you know, so like, well, what the hell's going on there? And, and going up to four-year level. So these studies are designed to do that. Uh, we think that we have all of the information already reported to us through the CBM reports to, to create the data for the two-year institutions. They don't really have to do much except review it and so forth. Four-year institutions are a little different because, like I said, they don't, they don't have those reasons readily available. So they're going to have to do some work on reporting those up. 
and we've had meetings with uh, representatives from uh, four-year systems and the independent, the public independent schools in Texas to talk about how to do that. They're going to provide us with some feedback. So we're doing some back and forth on, on how to affect that. Another piece of Senate Bill 25 revolves around advising. So the threshold now is uh, 30 hours for students and they must, and it actually says that they have to have a degree plan uh, by 30 hours. And then for dual credit students, they have to have a degree plan by the time at, within the second semester after completing 15 hours. So that will also be the subject of negotiated rulemaking next week as well. And, and by the way, one other quick thing about negotiated rulemaking, what I find really kind of fascinating about it, and uh, in, some, in a lot of respects, is that you, you put these 24 people in the room, and, and the coordinating board always has a representative on the committee, which, which is not true of any other advisory committee. But on, that, on those committees, the coordinating board has a representative that's a voting member. And the deal is you have to, you have to get to agreement by consensus. So all it takes is one person to say, no, I don't want to do this, and then you're done. Now, the trick to that is if the committee then decides, if the committee can't decide, then the coordinating board gets to do what they want to. And if, and if we don't like it, then we can say no. So, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I have, it's, it's really interesting, though, that, that how consensus is almost always reached on these things, by the way. A lot of give and take, uh, both on the part of the institutions, but also on the part of the coordinating board for that matter, uh, to, to try to make sure we really do reach consensus in the end. Uh, so it's, it's actually not, a, I had a lot of trepidation about the method when we first started this, and I've come to appreciate it uh, more. It works a lot better at the state level than it does at the national level. I mean, they, they got stuff that's been in negotiated rulemaking for years now. Uh, so another piece of that, another piece of Senate Bill 25 is course sequencing. And this is going to require institutions to put up the course sequence for their lower division for each major. Okay. This is what, when I started college, you know, you just opened up the catalog and the course sequence was laid out and said, this is what you're going to do in semester one and semester two. Go peruse a lot of catalogs and you cannot find that stuff anywhere. Uh, and so this is a way to get back to some of that so that it clearly gives students a, a roadmap and, and a timetable in some respect. This is how you get there. So they have to do, they have to lay out these course sequences. This is one part of SB 25 that doesn't have a deadline attached to it. So the negotiated rulemaking for it won't occur until January. So all of this stuff is in my division. So I'm sitting there looking at it thinking, okay, so what can I put off and what do I have to do immediately? I mean. You know, it's, it's, you know, there's only so many of us and there's only so much time in the day. And so I put that one off until January uh, because I could, frankly. Uh, but in the end, I, it should be very helpful to students. And what we hope to do is not just have a site where you can go look at these degree plans, but eventually also have the ability for students to be able to interact with that site and to actually go in themselves and do what some other uh, systems already do uh, and be able to plug in your courses and, and see how that's going to apply to different degrees at different institutions. These things exist already. What we don't have is a, a statewide uh, database, if you will, and system for looking at that at any public institution uh, in the state of Texas, from any public institution to any other public institution. And then eventually, I would hope that we also add the, the private schools into this as well, so the student can also do the same thing. So that if they want to transfer from you know, Collin College to uh, Rice University, they can also see how that might apply. So that's course sequences. The last part of this has to do with core curriculum. So, uh, you know, the core curriculum is 42 hours. It was originally created as a transfer device. So the idea was that students take the core curriculum at one institution, and then all of it or part of it, they move to another institution, and all that transfers with and of course, over the years, what has happened is, is it is absolutely true that it transfers. But it's also absolutely true that if you passed it, it's going to transfer. The real trick is whether it's going to apply to your degree or not. You can take 200 hours, transfer them, and not a single one of them apply to your degree. 
That's, that's theoretically possible. Okay? Uh, and so while the core was created as a transfer device, nobody ever really, now remember the core goes back to the 1990s. So nobody ever really thought about this applicability issue then. And so now people have begun to think more and more about, well, it's a great transfer device, but how does it work as an applicability device? And what we know is that, that it actually didn't work all that well, to be honest with you. Uh, it sometimes does and sometimes doesn't. But as, as I've often pointed out to people, out of that 42-hour core, there's only 12 hours of it that's actually common to all degree plans across the state of Texas. And what are those 12 hours? Six hours of American history, six hours of American government. And that's the result of a law passed in the 1930s. That goes way back before the core curriculum. And some people have said, a lot of people, when I ask this question, a lot of people say, well, there's a, always a 15 hours or so because there's English. No. There is one institution in the state of Texas that does not offer or accept English 1301. Okay. So that leaves us, uh, UT Austin. So that leaves us with 12 hours. So as an applicability device, that leaves you with 30 hours that may or may not. So this whole thing about the course started with a, a notion from uh, four-year institutions who talked about splitting the core. And the, the initial idea was that you take the core, that 42 hours, you, you divide it into a 24-hour general core, whatever that means. Yeah. 